All right, on Plain Spoken, I try to do lots of different things. I'm kind of spread out, but one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in is advancing this conversation about what the Global Methodist Church is going to be. I'm a Global Methodist elder. I serve on the Heartland Area TCAT, and I'm invested in a, a, a picture of a, a future Wesleyan denomination that really carries the banner that Wesley and the early Methodists carried. So to that end, there are a number of people that I've been talking to, some in the academy, some in the church, and then there are other people like me who just have an opinion, and they say it, and it's actually a good opinion. And so one of those is uh, Matthew Sickle, who I've known for some time. He came out of the Baltimore-Washington Annual Conference in the United Methodist Church, which I reported on, and uh, that's good reporting. You should check it out if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, but he, he put out a, a, a post that was really thoughtful a week or so ago. I said, hey, man, do you want to talk about this on camera? And he was really gracious to set aside some time before work today. He's a civil engineer, uh, very good mind. So we're really blessed to have him with us today. Matthew, thank you so much for joining me. How are you this morning? I'm good, Jeff. Thanks for being, being uh, available and interested in this stuff. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting topic, and I'm I'm just so glad other people are interested in it. Sometimes I think all people care about is just whatever grows the church, whatever whatever works. And I think there is something to say for practical theology, but I also think there is something to say for being intentional and about the kind of church that we create. And I know that that you and I are of of uh, one heart and mind on that. Um, the 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 setup for this. Well, before we get into the setup, let's learn a little bit more about who you are, because you're not in the United Methodist Church anymore. Who are you? Why do you care? Uh, what's 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 your perspective? Go ahead. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Reverend Matt Sickle. I'm a deacon in the Global Methodist Church, um, and I will remain so at least until God says otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I was called as a deacon in the United Methodist Church, um, and uh, my calling was not to the church, but to the academy. So. Um, that's uh, really where my heart and my mind are. But at the same time, because I'm a deacon, the objective of deacon's orders in the, in the UMC was to connect the world to the church and the church to the world. Well, my world has been the academy. So my goal has always been to connect the church to the academy and the academy to the church. Um, if we're not doing that, then uh, we've got two silos where two different things are being created and without interaction on that end you've got pastors coming out of an academy who have no idea how to deal with people in a local church and vice versa um and so that was my calling um and uh i i was called to teach theology um so i'm currently working on a phd um at the london school of theology in london england uh which is a cooperative program that they offer with asbury theological seminary um so i'm a student at asbury and a student at London School of Theology. Um, I'm supervised by both uh, faculty at Asbury and faculty at London. I'm doing a dissertation um, on how God uses food as a sacramental thing to create relationship with people. So in other words, why does the God of the universe who needs no food, who needs, has no reason to eat anything, interested in constantly trying to eat with people uh, and it's a biblical theology. So I'm looking at how God interacts with people over food um, in the scriptures. Uh, so that's the, the research work I'm doing. Um, in the meantime, I'm appointed to Grace Church Hanover in Hanover, Pennsylvania, um, with uh, Reverend Todd Christine, who is a fantastic guy. Um, he's the elder there. And I, I really believe wholeheartedly in, in what the vision was for the Order of a Deacon. Um, as opposed to this idea of transitional deacons going to, to become elders. Um, this servant ministry, uh, I enjoy, uh, and that's why I'm going to be sitting here as a deacon for a long time. Um, my day job, yeah, I'm a, I'm a licensed professional civil engineer, um, and I've worked in land development for 25 years. Uh, so uh, that's how I, that, that's my tent making, um, and uh, that's how I support my ministry. And for a very long time, the church has, uh, my local church, uh, both the church I came out of and the Baltimore Washington Conference, um, and many folks around me have supported me as almost a missionary in that um, they've supported my tuition to school. So it's a blessing. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, and in the intro, I, I failed to, to also note your role in public life in Methodist circles, I would 
characterize as primarily with boldness. I mean, you have been very intelligent, but you have um, gotten on the floor of annual conference and locked horns with the bishop. Uh, speaking the truth in love, you haven't ever been nasty that I've seen you. Um, but you've also published articles on bold topics. You've um, you, you've been a firm public witness. Uh, whether or not people know your name, uh, they probably should. I don't know. I didn't know it until last year, probably. But um, you're just one of the more thoughtful, more rigorous, more um, outspoken people um, within uh, Methodism. So uh, uh, I, I think it's really good that you've engaged on on this level. And I'm, I'm eager to have the conversation with you this morning. There are a lot of people that I start a conversation with, and I'm thinking, I know pretty much what they're going to say. I'm not in that place this morning. I really don't know what you're going to say. Um, and of course, I'd like to talk more about your bio and where you come from. And, and we'll probably just do that sometime on the phone or something, because uh, I'd like to think uh, we're actually kind of friends. We've chatted a few times, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll dive right into the content for today. Uh, Mark Tooley made a tweet saying, hypothesis, colon, post-schism traditional Methodist leaders have about five years to catechize their churches in Wesleyan belief and practice. Otherwise, they'll be largely lost to generic evangelicalism. So uh, I think that's in particular towards global Methodist church pastors coming out who right now the temptation is to focus on church growth, church building, evangelism, and Thule is saying, hey, uh, if there's not clarity about our distinct theological tradition and if you're not passing that on to individuals within the church, you will, we will sink into the sea of bland evangelical American uh, uh, culture. And so this is something that, that you uh, grabbed onto and made a, a very decent post. I'm, I'm going to put screenshots of this on the screen as I'm reading these things for people who are, who are uh, looking at this. The way you set it up is you said over 20% of congregations have left the UMC, most of which are conservative, traditionalist, evangelical. The straw that broke the camel's back was a consistent battle over human sexuality. Um, that said, I'm skipping a little bit. My biggest concern about those who have left is that the accent with which many of them speak their faith sounds fundamentalist slash Baptist more than Wesleyan slash holiness. As Mark Tooley suggested, there's a lot of teaching needs to be done in these churches in the coming years. So then you have a list that uh, we're going to consult for the rest of this talk, probably. Um, I, I'll count as we go along. Methodists are not independent, but connectional. Methodists have two sacraments, not ordinances. Three, Methodists baptize babies and believers. Four, Methodists do not hold to eternal security. Five, Methodists believe in freed will. Six, Methodists believe in Christ's triumphant return, not a rapture. Seven, Methodists ordain and empower women. Eight, Methodists value small group, ministry, bands, and class meetings. Nine, Methodists call scripture authoritative and infallible, but not inerrant. Ten, Methodists have general superintendents, in parentheses, bishops. I think that was ten. Eleven is Methodists believe in a second work of grace and a third and a fourth and look to Christian perfection in love or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And twelve, very good biblical number, Methodists work for God's justice in all situations. And then the way that you wrap this up is you say, for almost all of these things, there is a standard sermon written by John Wesley teaching them. That's where we find most of our doctrine. Last but not least, just to emphasize, Methodists are not Calvinist slash Reformed. So uh, battle lines drawn because as we have seen a lot of people exit the United Methodist Church, indeed, a lot of this has reared its head. Um, there are a lot of people sympathetic to Reformed uh, theology in differing ways, also sympathetic to more bland evangelical or Baptist um, uh, these are two different things, but Baptist believer baptism, not wanting to do infant baptism. Some of these, there's more pushback than others, but these are 12 things that I, I looked down in the comments for this. You just said, these really are essential Wesleyan doctrines. So would I be right in um, uh, putting words in your mouth to say, if these are not things that one uh, wants to affirm, 
then they really should question whether or not they want to call themselves Methodist. Would that be a fair, fair statement to make? I think on the whole, yes. Um, I think we can we can always have conversation about these things. And I, I'm I'm you know on the reform side, you know, there's the the, the classic tulip, the five point Calvinists. Well, I know many four point Calvinists and three point Calvinists. So you know you can play games like that and say, well, you know, I buy this or I don't buy this. In general, what I'm trying to say here is these are the things that distinguish. Methodism mm -hmm. outside of these other traditions, um, and and in some respects, it even distinguishes. I would say Methodism from our Holiness brothers and sisters in some of these cases, mm -hmm. or even our Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Even though we came up, we we all come out of the same stream. So um, yeah, I, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna quibble with me on some of these things, one or two, yeah, that's fine. But on the whole, that's this, this is what distinguishes Methodists. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, when we're talking, a lot of what undergirds this conversation is what is the role and function of denominations? Um, wh whenever I'm looking at a denomination, I'm, my primary loyalty is to my understanding of the church Catholic. And so ecumenism is, is really, a passion of mine and working with, you know, if I say they're brothers and sisters, I want to be able to work with them. So um, with denominations, I see denominational lines and distinctives being the non-negotiables. Like, hey, we really have a hard time worshiping Jesus with you if you don't share in this, this doctrinal conviction with us. We're not necessarily saying you're not a Christian. We're just saying, like, these really are the non-negotiables. And so I've wondered if some of the doctrinal distinctives of Methodism can fade into the background as historically interesting, but not really helpful in seeking Christian brotherhood in the future. Do you have a sense, like, of the things that are non-negotiable that, that we really need to maintain and hold on to, even at the expense of, of intimacy with Christian brothers and sisters in other traditions? How much of this do you think is essential, and man, we really need to hold on to it? And then how much of it do you think, how many of these do you think we can, we can let these go and really the, the legacy of the people called Methodist and its rigor and its doctrine, discipline, and spirit with which it's first set out is, is going to be just fine? Are, are all 12 of these really essential or do you think some of them could go and, and it might be okay? It's a hard question, Jeff. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if, if you want to let go of these things, mm -hmm. then go be one of those things that doesn't have this. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So, I, I mean, there's there's a reason I'm not a Baptist, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason I'm also not a Pentecostal. And in the same token, there's a reason I'm not at the Church of the Nazarene. And there's a reason I'm not a Roman Catholic. So, you know, I, I, yes, this is a question about roles of denominations. It's mm -hmm. also a question about how I connect the best with my faith. Um, I, I think everybody, and, and I've said this to the group, to, to groups that have, that have left, because in the Baltimore Washington Conference, you know, we've got churches basically chained inside, but we've got groups of people who wanted to leave. And they, they leave and then they say, well, we want to start a new thing. I said, That's great. I said, now you have to figure out who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's okay if you're Baptists, it's okay if if you think you're Anglican mm -hmm. or, or Episcopalian flavored um, Christianity. But but if you want to be Methodist, if you want to say, well, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have to start saying, well, what does that mean? Sure. Why is why am I not these other things? Yeah. And to me, this list is what distinguishes Methodists in America and in historically. And, um, you know, we may have to, a bigger conversation about what this looks like worldwide because this is the global Methodist church. But be that as it may, historically in the United States, I'm speaking to American culture really because Mark Tooley's tweet was about the same kind of thing. Um, but I think these 12 things make me a Methodist as opposed to any other flavor. Uh -huh. Now, 
a lot of them are in common with a lot of the other Wesleyan denominations, mm -hmm. but not all of them. And I think, okay, that's what makes me Methodist and not Wesleyan or Church of the Nazarene. Okay, okay. So going forward, we're, we're going to look at each of these, examine each of these as essentially authentically Wesleyan slash Methodist in its in its purest form. So let's let's just start at the top and go down. Methodists are independent, not independent, not independent. but connectional. So we're not congregational. We are Episcopal. Would that be a, a also st good stand in words for that? No. Okay. So what's no, the distinction Epis between Episcopal them? means Episcopal means governed by bishops. Okay, but so connectional you're down means on some other. <laughs> yeah. So we conference together. Remember, if if, if I were going to tell you, okay, what's the connection? I think Scott Kisker's piece um, that he put out probably 2018, 2019, which I heard the first version of in a speech, what is the connection, mm -hmm. um, really defines that. So you have the general conference, you have the annual conference, you have the charge conference, you have the class meeting, mm -hmm. this connection where we relate to the groups above us and below us. Um, that's what Wesley's connection was. That's what he envisioned so that we are uh, held accountable by folks above us and below us. So the general conference ordains or sends general superintendents to supervise the annual conference. The annual conference licenses or ordains elders okay. to supervise the charge conference. The charge conference elects class leaders to supervise the class meeting. So Wesley's vision of connection was about relationship among these different bodies. That's what I mean when I say connectional. It, and then I'm going to push a little further on this, and I'm going to point right back to um, the quote from George Whitfield, who was also, I would say, a Methodist. And yet he says at the end that his connection was a rope of sand because he never invested his folk into what Wesley had created with his connection. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get to bands and class meetings here in a bit, because that, that really is, that's something that I would agree is absolutely essential to, to be considered a, a Methodist Wesleyan. Um, but in the context of the current um, situation we're in, a lot of uh, annual conferences and bishops are arguing that local churches do not have the right to disaffiliate because they're part of a connection and they need to defer to the the will of the body, the conciliar body to, to which they report, in this case, the annual conference, to, to the degree that, that the will of individual congregations can be overruled by the conciliar body of the annual conference. So is that what you mean when you're saying we're not independent, but we're connectional? Is, is that the sort of system that you're thinking needs to be maintained? Well, you, I mean, here's the problem with that. Th those bishops are twisting the whole system. So you can't look to the United Methodist Church as a proper functioning of this thing because they've, it's been so twisted. And Kisker goes into that in his article. And if you want more on that, that's where I'd point you to go. Um, but this idea that, that the gen, I mean, look, they postponed general conference three times because they figured out if you can postpone general conference, you can't allow the body to work. And if you can't allow the body to work, then we can keep churches from disaffiliating. So this, that, that's really not a fair comparison to make at all. When it's working properly, you don't get that kind of push and pull in the connection. It's supposed to be a mutual accountability in Christ. That's what Wesley was trying to get to. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about accountable discipleship. And yeah, we're going to get to that with class meetings and band meetings. But accountable discipleship happens from top to bottom. And, and it happens, it should happen at every level so that you have general superintendents who are accountable to the general conference. That's what it means to be in connection with one another. Mm -hmm. I'm not only connection, connected to the folks in my local congregation, I'm connected to the larger annual conference. Mm -hmm. I'm connected to the general conference. We work together. We envision ministry together. Yeah. 
were not congregational. Yeah, yeah. The 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 pushback that that I and others have on that is just if 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 systems can be corrupted, then is there any protection for local churches when systems do get corrupted? And in a connectional system, it doesn't seem that there there can be or will be, uh, depending on which day I wake up and think about it. Sometimes I think any of us were lucky to get out of the UMC at all. So, um, you know, I've had this conversation in different forms with different people. Right now I'm thinking of Beth Caulfield. She's imagining that we can put new structures in place for the GMC to, to prevent the corruption and dysfunction from being replicated that, that we saw in the UMC. And um, I, I guess most days I wake up, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about uh, institutional purity being preserved. And so um, whether, you know, and there are some hills worth dying on just for doctrinal purity. And hey, if it means I lose a church building and some assets, fine. Um, but then sometimes I, I at least understand the impulse of some churches to say, we don't want to be, we want to be in connection in some ways with the larger body, but if, if we're talking about a coercive ability to rob us of the things that we have accrued, then no, we don't want to be connectional in that sense. And to that degree. Yeah. And I don't think that, I don't think that that's what we're talking about here. Okay. I think at least that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and yes, that's systems, good to clarify. System, human systems are corrupt just as humans are corrupt. Sure. I, I mean, you know, and here's the other thing. Mm -hmm. The church is always reforming. So we should always be reforming and we shouldn't end up in a situation where we're, we've become so corrupt that we can no longer reform, which is where the United Methodist Church is. Yeah. And, and so you've got to create systems within that institution to be able to continually reform so that you're not going to get screwed up like we've been screwed up. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I would love talking about that more, but we only have 30 minutes left and we have 11 more to do. So let's go on. Methodists Keep have... Going two sacraments, not ordinances. So that right there repudiates Roman Catholic theology, which has seven sacraments, right? And then it also yep. repudiates um, a lot of Baptist traditions. Um, and uh, well, it's not just Baptist. It's a, a, a huge amount of, of Christian traditions call these things ordinances, not sacraments, because they want to stay away from a Roman Catholic notion of some kind of mystical ineffable presence being in these things. They're much more comfortable talking about them being like tokens or reminders. Um, so do I have a proper understanding of why it's important to insist on only two, and these are sacraments, these are these are things containing mystical power? Um, is that the main thing you're trying to convey there, or are there other things that you're, you're trying to issue in that statement? Uh, no, I think that's it. I mean, I mean, this is bread and butter Methodism. Go back to the Articles of Religion. I mean, it's all there. Wesley talks about it. it this is an Anglican bit. I mean, you're coming out of the Reformation, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not radical Reformate. We're not Zwingli folks. Uh, that's that's what we're discussing here. Um, this idea that Christ is present with us in the sacrament in a way that Christ is not present with us in everyday activities. And they are a means of grace, meaning that we receive grace from God through them uh, no, this isn't the Roman Catholic understanding of grace, where it's some sort of cup that you have to keep filling up and keep full. If not, you end up in purgatory. But this is classic Anglican Reformation stuff. Mm -hmm. And and it's in the Articles of Religion. And so, you know, it, to me, you're not going to just dump this out like it's some sort of thing we're going to get rid of. Um, I've had lots of conversations um, with folks who come from the ordinance and my wife is Grace Brethren. Um, my family history is Mennonite. Uh, so that whole perspective I get, um, I grew up with a family from Southern Lancaster County, uh, Pennsylvania, where all of this stuff has sort of been a big soup. Um, on the flip side, and, and we'll get to this again with number three, we need to recognize the fact that there is a large swath of our church that came out of the Evangelical United Brethren world. Mm -hmm. And in the EUB world, these things look slightly different and have a slightly different flavor. Why? Because much of the EUB world was highly influenced by Mennonite Anabaptism. Why? Because Martin Beam, one of the founders of the United Brethren Christ, was a Mennonite before he was a Methodist. Um, so there's a history to that. And 
if you talk to my brothers and sisters who are Methodist in Southern Lancaster County, they're going to have a slightly different flavor on what a sacrament means, but it, it's not going to be an ordinance. There's a distinction, a slight distinction there. Sacrament wise, I, I said this to a Baptist pastor, my friend the other day, and he goes, oh, you know, that's really a good analogy. I'm going to use that for a future when I have to explain this to somebody. And I don't remember where I heard it originally, so I can't quote it, but, uh, Sacraments are like a radio. You get the radio, you tune the station to the station you want. In this case, it's the Jesus station. Jesus is always broadcasting on the sacrament channel. If you tune your radio in, you're going to get it. If your radio is not tuned in, if you're not doing the sacrament, you're not getting that broadcast. You might be getting other broadcasts from Christ, but you're not getting that broadcast. That that's what's going on there. The fact that Christ is present in a way there in those two things that he's not present in, in anything else. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I'm sure there's somebody to argue that I'm not one of them. It's just one of those kind of, I would, I would say it's, you know, bread and butter, you know, boilerplate. Uh, we're not the only ones who have this theological conviction, but it is firmly ensconced in, in Methodist to the very core. Um, baptizing babies and not believers. Um, this is not, correct. No, and believers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Notice how I wrote that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I shouldn't say. Well, of course we baptize believers. You know, there's not a, there's not a, a strand that doesn't baptize believers. There are strands that don't baptize infants because their notion is that one should not come into the covenant with Christ and his people until they understand what it is and can own it for themselves. And so there's uh, a couple hundred years of earnest and robust argument about that that we don't have to recapitulate here. But that that being said, there are a number of churches and pastors coming into the GMC that I think are not on board with infant baptism. And so uh, as, as we have that conversation and say this is what it means to be authentically Wesleyan, there are a number of people who say, I'm a Wesleyan, Arminian, Methodist. I just think that baptism needs to be a covenant people enter into with eyes wide open, to which it's a real question of, are we as a conciliar body at the general conference level going to say, we really can't have you bear the name of global Methodist if you're not willing to baptize infants? Is this, is this an issue? Is this a hill worth dying on and potentially dividing the GMC? Yeah, it's a hill worth dying on, and I think it— I mean, I'd look at that person and say, well, then go be a Pentecostal or go be a free will Baptist. I mean, you know, again, it's back to, well, what are you going to say we are? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, there are Wesleyan Arminians who won't baptize babies. I know some. Um, well, OK, so here's a pushback just real quick. What if one of them says, well, you're you're the crypto Catholic here. You're the one wanting to baptize infants. Why don't you just go join the Roman Catholic Church if, if you're so fond of infant baptism? Well, do you like all the rest of these things on this 12 list? You see what I'm saying? So if you're, if you're, you're saying Arminian, they would be on board with all of the other things in another like charismatic tradition. Uh, hypothetically, it seems like they would they, – they have a lot of Wesleyan distinctives as well, and they don't baptize babies. So that's already been created. However, well, okay, so like the Anglican Church, they also have only two sacraments, right? And they baptize babies. So, uh, I mean, I, I wonder if it's a helpful thing – well, as GMC people were leaving the UMC, a lot of people were saying, why start a GMC? There are already other Wesleyan, Arminian, uh, Methodist denominations. Why don't go join one of them? It just seems kind of like a – it seems kind of – you don't say it in a mean-spirited way, but – No, 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 no. I, I just don't – I don't know what you want to be then. You see what I'm saying? I mean – and that's why I say to these groups, figure out who you are. Yeah. I don't care who you are, but, you know – these are the things we are. If you want to do the things we are, then do the things we are. If you're not, then go do something else. Well, you know? so the, I, there are some people who think that we're at the stage of the conversation where we're deciding who we're going to be, and we get to decide on distinctives that may or may not bear all of, of these distinctives that, that you would say are part and parcel of being 
a Methodist. So there have been other Methodist traditions that break off over time, and they carry some, most of these distinctives, not all, you know, depending on which one not we're all. talking about. Yeah. And so is it the prerogative of the, of the GMC to say, you know, yes, these, some of these, most of these, all of these have been historically tied in one way or another to the people called Methodist, at least in the beginning. But because of this current historical moment, uh, ecumenical desires that we have, ways that we want to minister to the uh, the global context. Some of these we're just going to leave as signposts in the past and not not make uh, exclusive to the GMC. Um, is do you think that that it sounds like you're already coming in at the end of the conversation where we have it has been decided these are the things that the GMC will be. But I think there are a lot of people going whoa ho. Oh, we haven't had that conversation yet, Sickle. Hold on one second. Can we have the conversation? And uh, Well, I'm going to ask you back, Jeff, why? I mean, uh, and that's why I finished the post the way I did. Mm -hmm. For all of these things, there's a standard sermon written by John Wesley teaching it. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do with those? I mean, okay, John Wesley's standard sermons are doctrinal. John Wesley's explanatory notes on the New Testament are doctrinal. Mm -hmm. There's all over the place John Wesley talking about the fact that we baptize babies. Sure. So you, you can't say that, that Wesley's standard sermons are doctrinal and Wesley's explanatory notes are doctrinal. Mm -hmm. And then turn around and say, oh, well, we're not going to baptize babies. Right. Oh, okay. 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 I mean, I, so, you know, I, I, it's not – here's the problem for me. Mm -hmm. We didn't need a reformation on all of these doctrines. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the doctrine that was the problem. That's not why we're walking out the door. At least it's not why I'm walking out the door. Mm -hmm. I wanted the United Methodist Church. I wanted lots of what the United Methodist Church promised me. Yeah. What they promised me, I didn't get. Right. So what I'm trying to do is say, you know, I wanted what Methodism was supposed to be and it didn't get. So let's go get it. Figuring out what are the things that were screwed up that caused the problem to begin with and then correct those so that yeah. it doesn't repeat itself. Right. But, I mean, again, Wesley's, yeah, it was Billy Abraham, you know, who's, whose argument was these standard sermons form what we, we teach and preach. Mm -hmm. These explanatory notes form what we preach and teach. This is our book of doctrine. Mm -hmm. So... You can have a discussion about not baptizing babies, but you've got to deal with John Wesley on the topic. Now, if you read down in the comments on here, I had a conversation with a very, very good friend of mine in Baltimore, Washington, who came out of the Baltimore, Washington conference about baby baptism. Mm -hmm. And I pointed him back to the EUB heritage on this. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And I will also admit to you that neither of my children were baptized as infants. <gasps> not be <gasps> not because, not because of anything other than the fact that my wife came out of the Anabaptist tradition. I have family in the Mennonite tradition and in, that came out of the EUB church. Uh, it's not a big deal for me if you were or you weren't baptized as a baby. Mm -hmm. I don't care when you were baptized. It doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. What matters is that we allow it because there's a biblical case to be made for it. Yeah. And so if I walked into a global Methodist church and I said, would you please baptize my infant son? I don't want to get pushback from the pastor saying, no, we don't do that here. Right, yeah, yeah. But if I walk into a global Methodist church and say, hey, I, I have a brand new baby, uh, but I don't quite want to baptize him yet until he can make the decision for himself, mm -hmm. I don't want a global Methodist church pastor looking at me and saying, well, we don't do that here. Yeah, no, I hear you. Here, let's move on because I think, you know, it's really hard for me to argue against infant baptism. I mean, I, I, can, I can stand in the place of someone who does and say it's an argument from silence. It never tells us explicitly that infants were baptized. I don't think that's a particularly strong argument, so I, I just don't feel the need to recapitulate it here. Um, no, I don't either. Go the, ahead. The, the freed will one is the next one. And so that stands against reformed uh, thinking where they're really, they say they believe in free will, but then how they, uh, well, it depends on which ones you're talking to, of course. But uh, there are many that say they believe in free will, but they also believe God's sovereignty can and does 
somewhat often overshadow free will and that many, if not most people, really can't change their eternal standing with respect to being of the elect or the reprobate. That That's very far outside of, I mean, what, what you're presenting, when you say freed, a lot of people don't understand that, that John Wesley's notion is we all are born enslaved to sin, hopelessly uh, bent towards sinning, and it's only because of the preventing grace that God extends us that we can even wake up and turn towards him. But at that point, we can choose to walk in the light, or we can choose to go back to, to the, the, the vomit, a, a dog going back to its vomit. Um, right. So so there is no, the is there, I mean, in, okay, no, it's not one of the 12, but it's afterwards, you cannot be Calvinist reformed, you just say in the final thing. W- would that be pretty much this statement is just a repudiation of reformed theology? Well, I think that you're saying that it's it's one, two, three, let's see, four and five are both reformed theology. Eternal security is is part and parcel of reformed theology. Oh, I skipped and over that. I man, you thank did, you for calling me but, out. Okay, yeah. Uh, eternal but, security but would I was be that one saved, always saved. Both yeah. of them, yeah, that both of these go together anyway. All this is this is really all about reformed theology. It, it is from from. I mean, if, if you're thinking about again, tulip, mm-hmm. well. P is perseverance of the saints. That's eternal security. That's yeah. reformed theology. And um, yes, and you described Wesley's teaching on freed will properly. Um, this idea that that I can, that I have the ability to choose because of God's prevenient or preventing grace in my life. Um, yeah. And uh, look, Methodists are Arminian. Uh, it, you know, it's another one of these arguments that I don't think, well, if, if you're here and you believe these things, um, Fine, I'm not going to say you can't be a Methodist, but we're not going to preach it, and we're not going to teach it, and we shouldn't be. Um, you, you know, it just well, is. All cards on the table. This is one of the areas where I feel like I'm I'm wanting to push it at the moment, not necessarily on you personally, but just in the the larger conversation happening. I've ever since I came to understand the the Arminian versus re- Reformed divide, it's felt like an unnecessary divider in the body of Christ. Because I think that both extremes are ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous to imagine that we have no role to play and we're just puppets on the reform side. And I think it's ridiculous for for uh, for Christians to argue that we're just better than some people. You know, I really am smarter and I made the good decision. And these people were given the same free will, but you know, they're just they they love sinning. They're evil. They're choosing hell. You know, it just seems both extremes seem really ridiculous and uncharitable. And I think there has to be some way in which God's sovereignty and our free will operates, even if we can't calculate it or formula, formulate it. And so I just, I, I'm not, I'm personally just not interested in, we only go to this extreme on this side, we never go to this extreme over here. I, I think I'm much more interested in the prolonged conversation, okay, how, where is God's sovereignty operating you know, most Methodists would, would say there is no way God's plans can or will be foiled. You know, they would say that, well, our free will has something to say about that. So in some sense, God is going to overshadow our free will because his plans will be fulfilled. But then also, you know, most Reformed are not going to say we're just puppets. We There's no decision, really. You know, so you think you're oh, making decisions, you're not. He spends more time talking to Reformed folks. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I talked to quite a few to be honest with you, so I understand there are some pretty some pretty extreme uh, thinkers, maybe in pulpits or in the academy. But when you're talking about run of the mill reformed believers, um, I, it, it becomes incomprehensible to even go through your life imagining that you're not actually even making decisions. So it's it's just felt like you know, and that's not to. I, I don't know what your response to – as I talk about there being some synthesis in the middle that, that all Christians really have to occupy and that it might be beneficial for us to back off on this one in the extremes so that we can achieve more of a synthesis. Does that just sound like the voice of the evil one tempting you away from Methodism or does I'm, – I'm being hyperbolic here. I, I, but th- does that sound like it could be wisdom, like it might be – worth augmenting in a future approach, or does it really feel like we need to maintain a staunch aversion to anything that, that smells of reformed theology? Um, well, the only reason I would say we should is because of those loud voices on the reform side. I mean, they've really taken over the, the conversation in the larger, you know, and we're talking about, remember, back to Mark Tooley's post, we're talking about uh, what my 
my historical theology professor would always term garden variety evangelical. Mm -hmm. Well, garden variety evangelical is Calvinist. It's reformed. Why? Because they dominate the conversation in, uh, I mean, go into any local Christian bookstore. It's all, it's all Baptist and reformed stuff on the shelves. So it's not, it's not as if, yes, in the pew, folks probably don't, you know, there was an argument made that while churches teach, that while Reformed churches teach Calvinism in, in all of its fullness, the people in the pews operate as if they're Arminians. That's probably true. And so I think that's probably where you're feeling what you're feeling. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea to play that kind of a game when we're educating pastors. I remember my calling was to the academy to educate clergy. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're educating Methodist pastors, I think they need to know what Arminian theology is. And I think they need to be able to preach it well and teach it well. And it should be the accent with which they're speaking their faith in the pulpit. Remember, that was how I began this. I'm not talking about somebody who's got a thick Cockney accent. But we need to sound Methodist. We so, need, we Ryan, need to, you know the name Ryan Danker? Yeah, sure. I know okay. Ryan. He's a great friend of mine. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be talking to him tomorrow, recording a conversation with him. And he <laughs> he recently made a post saying a lot of people who think they're Arminian would hate reading Arminius. They would find his his actual theology repugnant. That that Arminian theology really doesn't bear much resemblance to the theology that he espoused. Is we don't have a lot of time for this, but I just wonder at your response to Danker's comment there. He's probably right. It's the same thing about people who read Calvin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's always the later thinkers who 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 refine these things. And so, you know, Calvin wasn't as Calvinist as Reformed people sound, but mm -hmm. his followers really made him sound that way. Well, Arminius, we probably wouldn't agree with all the stuff that he said, but Wesley and his world, you know, ref refined that. So, you know, I, yes. Danker is absolutely correct, and he's a great brother and a friend. And, well, so the, um, the theory I would, I would present here, and I would agree with you in your assessment there, but to say that meth if Methodism can only be distilled to what Wesley himself taught, that's one thing. If we, as the inheritors of the tradition, can refine it to mean some things that are largely the same, but also some things that are different, I, I wonder if that might be acceptable um, and so, you know, uh, with the reform thing, I do think we are going to have to carry forward a conversation because I'm, I'm going to keep talking until it's shown me how I'm wrong. But, um, you know, within the Republican Party, what we're seeing right now, I'm talking about rhetoric now. The rhetorical strategy of some is Trump was awful. We can have nothing. We need to go back to what we need to act like that never happened. And then you have Vivek Ramaswamy who's saying, you know, Trump did a lot of really good things I want to do, but he's old news. I want to do it new. And he's doing really well. I find that rhetorical point right there saying there's some good I want to work with. And then there's there's a lot of other things that I want to do as well. And so if, if Wesleyans are fighting the reform and going, they are totally wrong. We're on this other end over here. You need to come over here with us. I don't think that's nearly as compelling as going, you know, reform theology has some great points. And we also believe God is sovereign, but we think Reformed theology just goes too far with it, and we have a more nuanced and balanced approach that we think actually most people agree with. And so you might want to consider backing off from that extreme part and come be with us. Well, uh, uh, Scott Jones calls it the the radical center. I don't think he's calling it that anymore. I think he's kind of disowned that. No, he's not calling it that anymore. But no, I would agree with you. I would agree with you. And, and I'm really pushing back here against yep. the very loud voices coming out of the reform camp because they're the ones with the microphones and they keep getting the microphones. And I find very few Wesleyan Arminians with a microphone. Well, I'm trying to be the, one of those. So broad. from no, now on, you're going to be my I, biggest I supporter that. on plain spoken. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think I mean it's a, it's a question of what approach do we take because the world is drawn to the extreme voices, and so we can either become polarized by that and take an opposite extreme, or we can just go, hey, that guy has some good stuff, but uh, we're we're not going to go to that extreme. That that seems really problematic to us. We can validate this. We can't validate that. And if if you don't want to be on the extreme of this particular polarizing thing either, you might consider being with us. I think that would be a really strong position to take uh, with some doctrines, you know, not with all of them, you know, with. No, with, I, mean, I would agree with you. And again, remember, this is about accent. 
Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's what I, that's what my original okay. thought on this was. You okay. better yes. have an accent to the way you speak. Okay, I hear you. Well, the, with the, you know, I'm good friends with Ed Rodarmel. Uh, well, not good friends. We haven't like uh, hung out, but we we largely share in the same sympathies. He's the Omnia Methodist guy, and he is yes. sympathetic to Reformed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's it's just worth. He would be mad at me if he didn't make sure I recited. George Whitfield was reformed in his theology. Welsh, Welsh Methodists were reformed in their theology. Even though John Wesley did have a problem with that, it didn't keep him from accepting them in the fellowship. And so, well, I mean, hair's breadth is what is what John Wesley said about him and George Whitfield, and I would agree with that. And and the way I'd twist that back and say is whether the here's the question you ask. Well, we could sit here and argue whether the person lost his salvation or whether he wasn't ever saved to begin with. Either way, that poor soul needs Jesus. So would you please go help him? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the eternal security thing also hits on American baptism as well. I've, I've got mm-hmm. a number of Baptist people who once saved, always saved. And that re- that's another thing where I think when you read John Wesley's sermons, I remember him engaging this topic more in a more nuanced fashion than a lot of people who hold to free will. You can lose it at any time. He really did believe that. Um, well, he preached security assurance, um, but assurance, just, yeah, yes. But there was a difference between how he understood. So I think that's another area where we just need to have more patience for the conversation than a lot of people do because it requires energy on our part. And so one of the things I've been hoping in the GMC is a culture of just having patience for theology where there are a Mm -hmm. lot of, you know, within the UMC, it got to, how does this impact the mission? You know, how does this impact people on the streets? And that's fine. But if we don't have the energy for the conversation about who God is and who he's calling us to be, then I think we will fall prey to the same market forces that the United Methodist Church did. I think we just need to insist, this is a worthy conversation. And if you don't want to have it, you can be here, but you probably shouldn't be in leadership at least, you know? Yeah. I, and I think it in all of this, grace is the operative term that yeah. needs to be filtered through all of these. We're almost out of time. I'm, I knew this well, would happen. Well, grab some more. I'm, I'm happy to do as many or as few as you want. <laughs> I'm going to keep going until you say you've got to go. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. What do you, so when you say Methodists believe in Christ's triumphant return, not a rapture. So in 1 Thessalonians, Paul does describe people being caught up in the air and meeting Christ at his return. If that's what people mean by rapture, do you find that problematic? No. Yeah. Okay, so what you're referring uh, to uh-huh. is Christ and his angels coming and taking away all of the elect before the tribulation to be with him while he just pours out the cup of God's wrath on everybody left behind. Uh, I'm talking about that. I'm also talking about this idea that we get whisked off at any point to some other place. Okay. Because that's not what's described in scripture. Um, And and I just point you right over to N.T. Wright's fantastic book, Surprised by Hope. Well, in that um, one, he does mock the imagery, a literal interpretation of First Thessalonians, and I don't like him for that because in that sense, I am a biblical literalist, and I don't know how he so easily disregards that as uh, just a metaphor, but whatever. Oh, go, read, go back and read him again. He's not saying it's a metaphor. You're going to meet Christ in the clouds, uh-huh. and then you're going to escort him back to the earth as the king. Oh, uh, so well, I, yeah, yeah. I remember him saying it's like uh, greeting a, a, a victorious a Roman general. general. Yeah. yeah. But but even yeah. so, I thought he was saying it's it's just a metaphor. Like he's going to come in victory and yeah, we're not going to go anywhere rather. But also he says that heaven and earth won't be burned away, right? He, he says that there's just going to be a new new creation. Well, he, he says there will be a new creation, how it happens, and, and I, it's been a long time yeah. since I've read that book. Yeah, I but, shouldn't have gotten uh-huh. in the weeds there, but okay, so the main thing no, being— but, but in general, my, my whole point here is— is Methodists shouldn't be singing, not, I'll fly away, old oh glory. Yeah, and here's the problem. Here's the serious problem with that, at yeah. least for me. Yeah, go ahead. Well, well, number one, Wesley doesn't teach that. So, yes, you can go back and read Wesley's eschatology. It's not very— uh, developed systematically, it certainly doesn't look like anything coming out of Dallas. Um, but on the flip side, you don't read any of that in Wesley theology. Mm-hmm. The other thing is is on the on the subject of this sort of whisked away rapture before a tribulation bit. Um, 
a very good friend of, of and teacher that I've grown up with, um, uh, Reverend Rich Stevenson. Mm -hmm. um, he said the other week, or I heard from someone who had said that he had said, uh, if, if there's a rapture, we've got a lot to answer for for the church in China. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, they've gone through persecution we can't even imagine. Right. And yet we, we believe we're going to somehow be whisked away and saved from all of th That's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not fair. It's not the way God functions. But beyond all of that, I have a problem, and, and, and I read every single Left Behind book, so I know the, <laughs> I know the system, I understand it. Uh -huh. It was made up by Darby in the middle of the 1800s. And yes, he's probably grabbing on stuff from church history and all of that stuff, but why are we still fooling around with the theology that was made up in the middle of the 1800s by a guy from Ireland when we've got... 2,000 years of church history to talk about eschatology and what it means and how we interpret Revelation. And we get so focused on creating calendars and I, I have a problem with it. It's just, and it's not what Wesley taught. So well, why are we still getting sucked into it? We're, we're getting sucked into it. Okay, so there, there are liberals in seminary who argued that really before St. Augustine, there was no concept of the fall. They say that, uh, and what I would agree with is St. Augustine did uh, make much more robust a doctrine of the fall, but I would say that you find the fall in Scripture. Liberals would look at the same Scripture and say, no, the doctrine's not there. So, and I, Agreed. And I think that's how we get about Darby's um, dispensationalism. Uh, there's clearly a lot of scriptural language about the transition from this world into the next now, whether it all fits together into a, a systematic way, I don't think so. I have a hard time fitting it together. I see people like John MacArthur being very clear and many Darbyists being very clear. But I'm not, I'm not going to say that what they have uh, created is something out of whole cloth that, that, that only barely resembles what you find in Scripture. I'm just going to say that they systematize something that in the genre defies systemization. And so I'm, I'm in favor of this being another one of those conversations where we go, we don't go to this extreme place over here. We do believe in a second coming of Christ. We do believe in a new creation. We do believe in an end of history. But how that comes, we're much more open than these people on the extremes here. Um, that's And so rebuking, rebuking rapture feels risky to me because of the First Thessalonians uh, uh, reference, but rebuking Agreed. dispensationalism, but, formula, formulaic dispensationalism, saying that we don't do that, I have no problem with that. Would, would that sound like too a wimpy a position for Methodists to have? Okay. Not at all. Okay. And again, remember, we're drawing off of Wesley as, as, our, as our doctrine, so it, it's not there. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, well, so yeah, rapture. Well, rapture. First Thessalonians. Rap. If you want to call that rapture, that's fine with me. I don't care. Um, <laughs> but I'm talking. I'm. I'm. This point is literally a, exactly what you were saying. Mm -hmm. It's against the whole premillennial dispensationalist systematic whatever because it's just not what we do. Well. Mm. So I, I'm just wanting to say, like, yes, I, I'm fine if we have John Wesley as a backbone for our theology, but if we have John Wesley as a limiter the, for our theology, then I'm not sure I'm excited about that. Well, you got to deal with the fact that the standard sermons are doctrinal then. I, that's the problem out of all, you know, if you want to push against that, that's great. Yeah. But they're doctrinal. So I'm not, I, don't, I don't have a problem with the doctrines put in there. I just, I have a problem with people saying, we can't take a position on this because it's not it's not located in our doctrinal positions. Well, maybe so, but and, and I'm not saying we can't take a position on this. What I'm saying is is we can't take a position that's definitely out of step with what Wesley was writing about. Okay, okay. So Methodists really are constrained by. Okay, I, I understood you. Um, the next one is women. Methodists ordain and empower women. Uh, within early Methodism, women were used, uh, util not used, utilized, employed um, uh, for the proclamation of the gospel in different capacities. However, 
ordination of, of women in Methodism was not practiced until the early 20th century. Uh, the way that I would characterize the role and function of women in Methodism uh, until the early 20th century was that they were uh, um, utilized in a capacity of when men could not, were not willing to or not able or in enough numbers to fill those roles, but that there was definitely in the beginning at least a preference, if not an exclusive preference, towards men serving as clergy. Would you disagree with that? No. Uh, I would push back on your timeline because, uh, again, I come out of the EUV world in the United Brethren where we were ordaining women before 1900. Oh, so. sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but would you yeah, call the and, EUB remember, Wesleyan or Methodist? Oh, Absolutely. Really? Okay. 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 We'll have that conversation some other time. Okay. That's a different conversation. Okay. And that's, that's really my world. So, but yes. Okay. Um, I, I think you've characterized that correctly. I think, I think we have a lot to learn from our Pentecostal brothers and sisters about what this looks like um, and about how it can, uh, it can be uh, fleshed out mm -hmm. in Methodism. Um, I think they have, I think they have a better handle on, what it means that this, that your sons and daughters will prophesy. Yeah. So, but that's another conversation too. Yeah. I mean, this is a, I didn't think we would need to have this conversation to be honest with you. Whenever t people started splitting off from the United Methodist church, I, there was just so much rhetoric in place of this is going to maintain, this is going to continue forward. Uh, it's non-negotiable, but there are a lot of people coming out that are going, we'd like to negotiate. And, and uh, there, there is an instinctive reaction against that, that is just, very intolerant. And so this is another one of the conversations that I'm thinking, we need to be tolerant. We need to have tolerance for the conversation right now, because if we polarize on this, this is really a bad cultural moment to do it because the cultural moment is yeah. we're dealing with the trans phenomenon, which at its fundamental place is under the conviction that there is no real difference between men and women. It's only an aesthetic difference and one can shift between the two and there is no consequence. And so delineating that worldly ideology that's causing so much harm from this notion of female clergy that does on surface level at least seem to be the same thing that there really is no difference between men and women and they can operate the same way in the body of christ it's yeah. hard not to see much and overlap. that's not that that is a conversation that needs to be had and yeah. that's not what i'm getting into here and i didn't think i'm with you i never expected this to be an issue yeah. i really didn't i mean it doesn't make any sense to me but again when you're re if, if you're reading and seeing things that are out there in the Christian world, mm -hmm. you know, the Reformed complementarists have a lot of them, uh, stuff on this. Yeah. And, um, you know, it just it's going to take good teaching and good preaching. Well, and I think the proof has to be in the pudding. So you're wise, I think, to point to the charismatic tradition, which does utilize women in uh, ministry. The problem is that the stereotype of women in ministry is you can throw doctrine out the window when women come yes. on board, and you do find that yes. rife within charismatic Christianity. There is not a concern for doctrine. They believe all kinds of crazy stuff, and men are responsible for that too, but you don't find something like Reformed Christianity but with women that, that guards solid doctrine and has women in ministry. There does seem to be Gosh, they always get held up, don't they? They're the ones that hold on to the doctrine, the Reformed folks. Yeah, that's just because they like to wear bow ties and read too much, I think. <laughs> well, I, I, I think – so let me, let me tell you, I'm uh, – for me, the question is not can women lead because obviously they can. Uh, it, it's a hypothetical. It's not like you put a woman in a position of leadership and they're like, what do I do? You know, like – or it, it, it's, it's more – to my mind, what happens when you mix men and women without concern for the risks that happen and the things that can go wrong? Oh, around? absolutely. And absolutely. so whenever the church did have defined men's and women's spaces and we collapsed that all together and a lot of bad things happened, so far the response seems to be, well, we just need to end sexism. Well, good luck with that. You know, uh, We just need to, to treat people to look at women as not gendered beings. Well, good luck with that. But I'm I'm not seeing how this functions. If you don't have separate men's and women's spaces, and now I'm talking broadly in society, if we don't protect men's and women's spaces and we just collapse them all together, I I'm not sure that long term 
um, we can protect against the bad things that we see happening. So I, I just need to look more at charismatic Christianity and the ways that they've guarded against that because it, it seems to me after Me Too in particular, it just got really messy and we're trying to make something happen that a lot of times we're more limited than we understand. So it's not to say it's impossible, but I think it is more difficult than most people give uh, room for. No, I agree with you 100 percent. And I think, you know, we're having this discussion right now in the camp meeting where I go. OK, so I've, it's 130 year old Methodist space camp meeting. There's the camp association and the ladies auxiliary. OK, well, we just elected a woman president of the camp association for the okay. very first time ever. OK, it was done without much fanfare and nobody really cared. And there have been women serving on the association for decades. Mm -hmm. But what's the place for the ladies auxiliary now? Right. And, you know, so that's a different conversation, but it's you connected. can't have that conversation unless you recognize the fact that women can and should lead. Well, OK, so Rachel Yankovic is the daughter of Doug Wilson, who uh, leads Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho, a high, very far reformed church. And she is a fantastic leader. I've seen her stuff. She is an excellent speaker, but she's very clear. I'm not ministering to men. If you want, if you're a man and you want someone to minister to you, listen to a man. I'm here for women. And so within the reformed complementarian world, and all cards on the table, me and my wife have a complementarian marriage. We we are very different. We don't do the uh, 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 we do the one has one role, one has the other. There are many people who look at ministry that way, where yes, women are called to lead, women are called to prophesy, women are called to 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 exercise authority in the body. However, it's only in these protected female spaces rather than over the entire body. Um, and so well, that, that seems to me to have a lot of chutzpah as far as I'm concerned. So uh, <laughs> a woman can only speak to women, not to men, but a man can speak to both women and men. Yeah. So I, historically, is, the role, the, the argument made is that men psychologically in a group dynamic can function in an androgynous role, whereas women cannot. And that is, that is deep in human psychology. Yeah, I'm sure it is, but give me a break. <laughs> I mean, okay. you know, your wife's going to yell at you in the house whether she's going to, you know, when you've done something screwy, you, the first person you're going to hear it from is your wife. Um, and if you've done something screwy in the church and you can't take correction from a woman for the same reason, I, I, to me, this is, this, again, this isn't a conversation we should be having at this point. Hmm. Yeah. The conversation needs to be. How do we do exactly what you were saying? Mm -hmm. Provide protection and space for all of the benefits that come from women-only space mm -hmm. and men-only space. But at the same time, we're called to submit to one another mm -hmm. in love. It doesn't, you, you know, we husbands love your wives. But before all of that is the statement from Paul to submit to one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's and not Ephesians gender. 5, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's not gendered. And and if the if at the fall the problem between women and men was exploded, mm -hmm. if you're going to reverse the fall, if we're looking for a reversal of the fall, mm -hmm. I don't I don't see a it, you can't continue the kind of behavior that the fall was said to represent. Um, and and you're and, and I think. I'm glad to hear you say that I'm going to go talk to my charismatic brothers and sisters yeah. because I think they've got it and, and we don't. Okay. Well, it's a conversation whether or not I'm, – I'm not going to advance the conversation beyond here anytime soon because I don't, I don't think that would be helpful right now. But it is something that I notice a number of people wanting to talk about. So I'm just wanting to exhort people who do have the firm position women belong in ministry to go ahead and renew why it is they believe that so that they can articulate it with grace and patience rather than frustration that ah, we have to have this conversation again. You know, it's just, it's not going to help the cause. I don't think so. Um, no, agreed. And, and I would, I would also say that if you go back and look at our history, mm -hmm. it was the evangelical Methodists who were pushing the whole idea of empowering women. Right. It was the conservatives at the time who were doing it. Right. And and I'm gonna and I'm gonna tell you I can I can't I can't go any further on this with you this, this morning. Okay. Uh, okay. I gotta go. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the time, Matt. Thank the, you so much. 
not just because of work, but because the battery in my computer is going to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, listen, if, if you've, you've, you've hung out with us and you want to hear us complete the list, go ahead and comment and, and send Matt an email and beg him to make more time. This is, this is hard for him. We, we put this together early in the morning because he's a busy guy. Uh, but Matt, you th- thank you so much for taking the time, and, and uh, let's just pray that, that people attend upon your words and, and gain wisdom and that the, the GMC is enriched by, by you. Thank you so much, brother. My pleasure, Jeff. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you for the chance to talk, and I'd love to have more conversation with you in the future. So if you want to do another one, just give me a holler. Right on, brother. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Well, that was the end of that. So uh, I knew it would be that good. Matt's a very interesting, uh, very intelligent guy. So hopefully you were able to enjoy that and track all that. If you if you were interested in that, then go ahead and uh, – Tell us to put it together. We'll try and put another one together. If there are other topics that you're thinking need to get figured out for the GMC at this point, and there needs to be good convers, I'd like to think I'm a good conversation partner at that. Uh, but also, if you notice any rhetorical things that I do that just aren't helpful, then now's the time because I'd like to be a helpful interlocutor for um, this stuff. I don't imagine I'm the only good voice, but I do think we need some voices that are doing this work so that other people can just tune in and think about it and go, well, you know, how do I think about these things? And so in particular, this this conversation I think would be useful for people saying, okay, do I think that the global Methodist church should be limited to the doctrines espoused by John Wesley, or is it possible that we augment some of them because we have tried some of them, and, and they don't seem to really gel with our uh, connectional communal experience of, of who we're called to be? Or um, are there new dro- doctrines or um, uh, new practices that, that we can and should engage in that are not firmly based in Wesleyan doctrine and theology? You know, so uh, these are not easily answered questions, and they're, they're really things, you can't even figure them out at General Conference. At General Conference, there's so much needs to get done. There's so many people... These are the sort of things that Methodists need to be thinking through between sessions. They need to be talking about these things with each other. So if you have a Sunday school class or a class meeting, if, if you're a pastor and you have connectional groups with other clergy, I would like to think that, that these are things that, that we can be talking about rather than politics or sports or hobnobbing. You know, we have a lot of significant, important things that we can and should talk about. So I pray that our conversations are seasoned with salt and that the Global Methodist Church is created over the coming years, uh, informed by a lot of really good um, holy conferencing that takes place in the meantime. All right, thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time. Blessings.